I want to invite you to join me in James chapter 2. Now, I know that I've preached in this vein before, so I'm going to kind of warn you in advance that this is not altogether new material. I may approach some things a little differently than I have in the past. I may say some things I haven't said in the past. It's like one preacher said, I heard about, he kept preaching for week after week, month after month, he kept preaching the same sermon in his church. Same message over and over and over again. Finally, after a couple months had passed, a bunch of his elders got together, and deacons, and they came up to him and they said, Preacher, um, would it be possible for you to move on and maybe preach something different than the same message you've been preaching now for the last couple of months? And the pastor looked at his men, his deacons, his elders, and he said, well, I'll tell you what. He said, when y'all get this down and you start living this, he said, then I'll move on to something else. Hello now. Amen. I preach what God gives me, folks. And if the Lord gives me something that is similar to something I've preached, you know, before, then that means that we need a refresher. Amen. We need a reminder in this area, in this vein. Amen. So, uh, James chapter 2, beginning at verse number 14. And we're going to read today through verse number 26. James chapter 2, verses 14 through 26. The King James text today reads... What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith, and have not works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, Notwithstanding, ye give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works. And I will show thee my faith by my works. Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought with his works and by works was faith made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed, imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. Ye see then how that by works a man is justified, and not by faith only. Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot, justified by works when she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way for as the body without the spirit is dead so faith without works is dead also amen i accidentally i think when i put an invitation online this week for folks to join us for our service, 
Uh, I think I accidentally titled it uh, something different, but our message today is the vanity of effort, effortless faith. Amen. The vanity of effort, effortless faith faith. Boy, I'm tripping on my words. If you'll bow your heads with me one more moment, let's go to the Lord once again. Master, Savior, Redeemer, and King, we love you, Jesus. We love you, Lord. We thank you, God, today for the revelation of the power of Jesus' name. We thank you, Lord, today for an understanding of one God in Christ, and Jesus is his name. We thank you, Lord, today that one day you led us into the full Gospels, the full salvation message of the full Gospel. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Master, the Word of God is now to go forth, and you have placed this great, important task upon the shoulders of mere mortal men such as I. And my God, today, if I'm to be the least bit effective, if I'm to be uh, the least bit able to do that which I have been called by you to do, I need the anointing of the Holy Ghost, the presence of God, the confirmation of the Spirit in the heart of every hearer. That that which they hear is not merely the edict of men, the thoughts of men, but rather, O oh God, it is indeed a word from the Lord for the people of God at this hour. Anoint today, O oh God, my lips. Anoint as well the ear of every hearer. Those who would listen right now live, those who will listen later by reason of recording, let our heart today, God, if it be fallow ground, if it be stony ground, let it right now by the Holy Ghost be torn up and cultivated that it might be ready to receive the word of the Lord and let the word of God like healthy seed fall upon good ground that it might take root and spring forth and bring forth fruit unto righteousness in our lives. Help us, O oh God, today to be more like you, for that is what you've called us to. And help us, O oh God, to be a better testimony and a better witness in a lost and dying world. We ask it all today in none other than Jesus' wonderful, precious name. Amen. Praise God and amen. The vanity of effortless faith. You know, we live in a world today where things are just getting, honestly, it's just getting worse and worse by the day. Human beings want more and more than they've ever wanted before, but they want to be able to do less and less to get it. Hello now. Oh, we got people, they want to go to jobs and they want to get paid more than they've gotten paid in the past, but they want to be able to get paid more for doing less. Hello now. When I was young, I, I was raised around people. Uh, my father, my grandfather, uh, my uncles. Uh, I was raised around men who believed in what we used to call a work ethic. And that was, if you're going to get paid a day's labor, then you put in a day's work. And I tell the truth today. Sounds like Ginger's having a little attack of allergies herself today. But it used to be that you understood if you expected your employer to pay you a wage, then it was expected of you to give your employer an honest day's work. I worked for a while uh, delivering parts for AutoZone. And I used to drive around one of those AutoZone pickups that you may see riding around town. And I would go from our store to uh, different uh, 
uh, uh, mechanic shops around the area and I would deliver parts that they were ordering for jobs that they were doing and I'd pick up other parts that they were returning uh, whether they be uh, defective parts or whether they be warranty parts and uh, there was another fellow who worked in the same store I did he was a little bit older than me and uh, he would come into work in the morning and then he would find a way to get lost in the warehouse at the back of the store and he would literally wander around in the warehouse and he would literally folks he would kind of try to hide himself is what he would do so as the orders came in uh, the other drivers and myself would wind up picking those orders up and then we'd have to go into the warehouse and we'd have to pick the order out, get the parts, and then we'd make it ready and we would put it in the truck and when we had enough orders together we'd go out and we'd deliver parts to all the various shops that we needed to deliver to. Well, this guy would spend his entire day trying to avoid doing as much work as he possibly could avoid doing. And I'm, gonna, I'm not going to lie to you. I'm going to tell you honestly. It kind of got on my last nerve. Because here I was, I went to work, and my thought was, uh, these people are paying me by the hour and I'm going to give them an honest day's work and I'm going to try to do as much as I can do. Not as little as I can get away with, but I'm going to try to do as much as I possibly can do uh, during the course of the work day. And so I would work myself to the bone trying to get as many orders delivered and picked and, you know. And, and, and then there's this other guy who comes in and he's making the same money I am. But he's hiding out in the warehouse doing nothing all day long. And every once in a blue moon it seemed like the manager of our department would catch him, you know, and maybe send him out on a delivery or two. But this man did so little. But that's where we're at today. That's the mindset of many Christians today. Oh, I want to make heaven my home. I want to see Jesus one day. I want to call myself a Christian, but I want to do as little as I can do. I want to get away with uh, doing as little as possibly can be done. And yet in the second chapter of the book of James, James, the Lord's brother, this is Jesus' literal physical half-brother, James. James brings up an important subject that none of the other apostles, none of the other leaders, had. now James, the brother of the Lord, was not technically an apostle of Jesus. He was certainly a follower of the Lord. And you find, if you read in the book of Acts, you find that James, the brother of the Lord, was very active with the apostles and he had a lot to do with much that the early church did and many of the decisions that the early church made. But James, in his epistle, he brings up a really important fact. And he says, folks, do you really think that just believing is enough? To secure your justification. Do you really think that just believing is enough to making certain that in the end you will be saved? He said, don't you understand? And I'm going to paraphrase the first couple of verses that we read today. This is what James was saying. Don't you understand that talk is cheap? I just said in three words what took James two sentences to say. Talk is cheap. He said, don't you understand that talk is cheap? Just because you say you've got faith, that doesn't mean anything. That, 
That is vanity, meaning it's worthless. It has no value. It is without any value whatsoever. There are a lot of people who are going to wind up in hell. A lot of people who are going to wind up lost. A lot of people who are going to stand before God in the judgment and say, Oh, but Lord, I professed faith in Christ. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And the Bible said that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Glory to God. Hallelujah. And like a good Baptist Lord who preaches that faith alone saves. And they don't believe that. They preach it, but they don't believe it. Say, well, Pastor, how can you say that? How can you put down an entire uh, movement within the Christian world by saying that they preach something they don't believe? Well, honey, it ain't hard to figure out. Because just ask them if, if the gay man down the street who honestly, sincerely believes with all his heart that God raised Christ from the dead. Ask him if that gay man who professes Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. Ask him if that man is saved. And I guarantee you that Baptist will tell you, no, he ain't. So apparently faith alone is their professed doctrine, but it's not their truth. Hello now. Oh, no, 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 no. No, they preach that you've got to change. Why, you've got to change who you are. You've got to pray and fast and you've got to do all kinds of stuff. You've got to go to psychiatrists and psychologists and counselors and ex-gay camps and you've got to do everything in your power to change your orientation or else you're going to be lost with the rest of them. Oh, I see. So in other words, faith alone doesn't save. Hello now. You know I'm telling the truth. Mm -hmm. See, I like to call out hypocrisy. I like to call it out because uh, too many people are affected by this. And yet there are too few preachers who are actually putting a face on it. Hello now. And calling it out for what it is. It is hypocrisy. It's garbage. They preach a message of faith alone, but in the end, faith alone won't cut it. I'm here to tell you today, the brother of Jesus, James, helped us to understand that faith alone is vain. Faith alone has no value. It is worthless. It will achieve nothing for you. Why? Well, it's simple because faith is activated by works, meaning it is activated, as it were, through action. If your actions do not demonstrate your faith, then you do not possess the faith that you're professing you have. Hello now. How many Christians we know in the world today in the era of Donald Trump and make America great again? How many Christians in our world today profess? I love how they run around and they, they post these memes on on Facebook and on YouTube and all this and on uh, Twitter, you know. And it says, oh, no matter who's president, Jesus is king. And then in the next breath, they are wailing and moaning and groaning about Biden. And they're wailing and moaning and groaning about Obama. And they're wailing and moaning and groaning about the Democrats. And they're doing everything in their power to exercise all the political uh, influence they can possibly exercise. Why? Because what they're saying and what they possess are not in sync. Talk is cheap. Anybody can run around and say, oh, I believe God is in control. I'm not concerned about tomorrow. I'm not concerned for our country because I know that whatever happens, whether things happen that I agree with or whether things happen I disagree with, it doesn't matter. In the end, I know that God is in control. 
I'm going to tell you, there have been leaders elected in our country that I disliked vehemently. I did not care for those particular people at all. And when they were elected, I didn't run around like a chick with my head chopped off trying to... Uh, uh, you know, do everything I could to come against this person and trying to do everything I could to oppose their agenda. No, uh, there have been any number of leaders that have been elected in this country, in Congress and Senate and uh, the White House. And, uh, you know, and I have just rolled it out and said, that's all right, it'll be all right. God's in control. In the end, God's in control. But you know what, Tommy? I really believed that. See, if you don't really believe that, then you're not going to act like that. Am I tell the truth? See, this is the problem we have. James said, faith without works, meaning action. He said, faith without action is dead. If faith is trying to stand alone, faith will not stand by itself. It needs action to support it and in effect to activate it, to put it into motion. Faith only works when our actions are behind what we're professing to believe. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? That's why he used the example, he said, if you've got someone who's hungry, somebody who's really struggling and going through a difficult time and all you do is pat them on the back and say, well, bless you, brother, I'm praying for you. He said, what good are your words? The, those words mean nothing. He said, why in the world would you not give him what he needs? Why would you not give him clothing? Why would you not give him food? Why would you not give him water? Because your words alone are worthless. And James uses this to illustrate the concept of faith without action. Said faith without action is the same as patting somebody on the back and sending them away without having actually done anything to change their circumstance. Your words mean nothing. It's it's useless. And yet we have Christians in our world today who think that they can run around professing. They go to church and they sing the songs of Zion. They sing words that they do not in reality believe. I'm going to tell you, there are churches full of people singing words they don't believe. I believe the reason the Pentecostal movement today, and I'm going to get on the Pentecostal folks because I number myself among them. I'm going to get on the Pentecostal folks today. I'm going to tell you a little secret. I believe the reason you don't see the move of God and you don't see the power of God and the demonstration of the Holy Ghost and you don't see the healings and the deliverances and the miracles that we used to see in this movement not so very many years ago. The reason you don't see it today like we used to is very, very simple. It's very simple. It's because the majority of people in Pentecostal churches, have pos they possess faith only in their mouth. My Aunt Susan, my father's sister Susan, she said years and years ago, she told me many, many years ago, she said, you know, when I was a kid, your mother and your grandmother uh, invited us to go with them to church. And we would go to Brother Tatlock's church up there in Wolcott, Connecticut. And she said, and boy, I'll tell you what, the way them people worship, she said, whoo, howdy. And then they would shout, and then ladies be running the aisles, and they'd be dancing in the aisles, and they'd just be shouting, and it'd be so loud and boisterous and so energetic. And she said, and I loved every minute of it. Said, my God, I love that environment. I love loved that. She said, I loved being there. There was something about it. And my Aunt Susan, who was not raised in church, who, who was not exposed to a lot of church, my Aunt Susan said, there was something about the way those people worship. She said, you knew that they 
they honestly believed every word they sang about. They believed every word Brother Tatlock preached. That was, it was not just a, a, a game to them that they played, but they really believed it. She said, my God, their worship demonstrated that their faith was real. Do you hear what I'm telling you? And this was an observer. This was somebody who wasn't accustomed to church, especially old-time Holy Ghost-filled, Pentecostal, shouting, dancing, running the aisles kind of churches. But that was my Aunt Susan's observation. And she told me, she said, to this day I will not go to a church if it isn't a Pentecostal church. She said, the only church I'll ever darken the door of is a Pentecostal church. She said, because I love that worship and I love, it feels so real to me. She said, there's something about it. I've been to Catholic churches. I've been to Episcopalian churches. I've seen Presbyterian churches and Methodist churches. Oh, but there's something about that Pentecostal worship that just rings so true to me and rings so real to me. I will tell you, there's a reason why, Tommy. You go into most Pentecostal churches today and you don't see them shouting anymore. You don't see them running the aisles anymore. You don't see them dancing under the anointing of the Holy Ghost anymore. And the reason is simple. <coughs> because their faith is in their mouth. They talk a good talk, but talk is cheap. If they really believed what they claim, if they really believe what they profess, it'd be like Riverside. Well, I'm going to tell you, Riverside, I'll never forget the first time I went to Riverside Church of God. Never forget it as long as I live wasn't really the first service, it was the second service. First service, the Holy Ghost got hold of me and shook me loose. And for the first time in my life, I danced and shouted. And I've never had that happen at church in my life before. But my first visit to Riverside on my first Sunday morning there, the Holy Ghost touched me and my God, I jumped up off that pew and I danced and I shouted all over the place. And I had never done that at church a day in my life. But it was the next service, that evening, that Sunday evening. Brother Gillum said, Chuck, I understand you sing, son. Sister Overton tell me that you sing, so why don't you sing a special for us tonight? So I got up, and I didn't know how they did things, but when the pastor asked you to sing a special, those who sang specials would get up, and we would... Uh, sit on the, the front pew of the choir area there and then in the order that he asked you to sing a special, if he asked two different people or three different people, you'd get up and sing your special and sit down, you know. I'd never been to this church before. I mean, except for that morning, right? I don't know how things happen in this church. I don't know how things work in this church. I grew up in New England, the church I grew up in. We had a wonderful move of God in the church I grew up in, but things had begun to die. The older I got, the more the church I grew up in was dying. And it broke my heart. So here I am. He had asked me first, so I get up to sing first. And a lot of times before you sing, you know, you'll start to share a little testimony. And I begin to talk about the goodness of God and how much I love the Lord. And, all. and next thing you know, the anointing come over me. And I mean to tell you, I begin to preach. I just, the Holy Ghost was on me, and I begin to preach. And... And it happened, honestly, I, I can't even describe it. it. It was almost like being drunk because I was not in control. It was like, it was almost like I lost control of myself, you know. And I just started preaching. And all of a sudden, my God, the people in the church were up on their feet waving their arms and they're shouting. And I mean, people started dancing and we, people are getting happy. And I'm looking around and thinking, what on earth is happening? Because I didn't recognize what was going on in this church. But see, these people believed what I was saying. Oh, hallelujah. They believed what I said. Oh, my God. They didn't just sit there on their laurels and say, Amen, brother. Yes, that is true. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. 
No, sir, they were up on their feet and they were shouting and they were raising their hands. And and so I get done with my little sermon. It lasted about maybe five or eight minutes, maybe. And I, I realized what had happened, that I had just preached practically, right? And I lost myself. I completely lost myself. And I thought, uh-oh, I wasn't supposed to do that. I, I was I, now I can't remember what I was up here to do. So I literally walked over to Brother Gillum, who was sitting on the front pew. When the people would sing specials, he'd go down and sit on the front pew, you know. And I handed him the microphone. I didn't even sing my song. And Brother Gillum got up and he put his arm around me and he said, I believe the Holy Ghost is trying to use this young man tonight. He said, I believe God's using Brother Chuck tonight. He said, how about, so look to me and he said, you ready for a prayer line? And I looked at him and I said, uh-huh. And in my mind, I thought, what on earth is the prayer line? I didn't know what he was talking about. I had never heard the term prayer line in my life before. Well, down south, they did things different than they do up north. Up north, preachers oftentimes would invite people to come down to the altar that needed prayer, you know. And, and they would just all come down at one time, and they'd come across the front of the sanctuary. And then he would go, and he'd lay hands on them and pray for them, uh, you know, uh, one at a time across the front. If he just said, are you ready for an altar call? I would have understood. But he didn't say, he said, are you ready for a prayer line? And I'm looking at him, uh-huh. He said, if you need God to do something today, he said, I believe God's using this young man. He said, if you need the Lord to touch you and heal you, if you need the Holy Ghost tonight, he said, let's make a line down the front, down the center of the center aisle here. He said, let's have us a prayer line. And then one by one, people begin to come forward, and I begin to lay hands on them and anoint them with oil. And all Brother Gillum did was hand me the anointing oil. That's all he did. And I started anointing people and praying. And these are people I've never met them. I don't know who they are. I don't know their names. They don't know me. And I mean these ladies. All of a sudden the Holy Ghost touch them. And old sister now. Woo! She gets to shouting. And she starts dancing all across the front of the church. And then Sister Richardson. She gets to shouting. Woo! Sister Sensible. Woo! And I'm standing there just mesmerized. I never saw people wreck like this. I, I never saw the move of God like this. I've never seen anything like it in my life. But these are people who believe this thing. These aren't people who are playing the game. These people don't come up to the altar to get prayed for just so they can turn around and go back to their seat nice and quiet like, no sir. They go up to that altar and I mean to tell you they're believing God for a touch. They're believing God for a miracle. They're believing the Lord is going to do something for them. And honey, when the Spirit of the Lord touches their spirit, when they feel God touch them and let them know I'm taking care of it, I'm going to do for you what you need done, all of a sudden there's something to happen. Amen. They get happy. They start to shout. They start to run. They start to dance. And it wasn't just the ladies either. It was the men too. It wasn't just the men and the women. It was the young people. The teenagers too. My little nine-year-old, I think he was at the time, cousin Sean, comes up and stands in front of me. And I get down on my knees and I look into his little eyes and I said, Sean, honey, what do you want the Lord to do for you today? And he looked at me and Sean had a little bit of a nasally voice, you know. And he said, Chuck, I want the Lord to fill me with the Holy Ghost. Nine years old. He said, I want the Lord to fill me with the Holy Ghost. I knew what that was like because I'd been in that same place myself as a kid. And God filled me as a kid. And I reached around his back. I don't know why I did it this way. It had to be God. I reached around his back 
and I put my hand up on his forehead and I kind of pulled him into me a little bit and I just said, Lord, in the name of Jesus, fill him, God, right now with the Holy Ghost. And when I did, his little body went limp and he fell backwards on the floor. Talking in tongues. Can God fill little nine-year-old Sean with the Holy Ghost? That night, oh, I'm going to tell you, you get around people who believe this thing. You get around people who, whose faith is deeper than their mouth. You get around people who really believe this thing more than just professing and talking a good talk. And making a good profession. You get around people who believe this thing with every ounce of their being. And I'm going to tell you something. Church is going to be so much different than anything you've ever experienced in your life. Worship is going to be different. We've had some people in our church... Over the years, and I've made comments, and some people have taken offense at it. Well, like I've said before, honey, if you take offense at it, then there's a good possibility that it applies to you. Because if it don't apply to you, then there's no reason for you to take offense at it. But we've had people in our church who bragged about there are many, many years in the Pentecostal movement. Oh, they bragged about the fact they had the Holy Ghost for so many decades and blah, 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 blah. And they bragged about their many years in the Pentecostal church. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And then the pastor had the nerve to get up and say, you know, sometimes you've got people who brag about their years in the church, but they still don't know how to act. They still don't know how to do. And oh, if they take offense at that, well, ha, well, Pastor, surely he was talking about me. Well, first of all, I wouldn't necessarily talk about you. There's a whole lot of people in the church who fit that bill. But if you take offense at it, then maybe it is you. And some of these people, Tommy, I've told you in private over the years, I said, man, I wish this person acted like they knew how to worship. I wish this person acted like they knew how to pray. I wish this person acted like they knew how to lead. I wish this person acted like they knew how to take instruction. I wish this person acted like they understood the role of a church member and they acted like a church member when the pastor asked them to do something. They would do what they were asked to do, no more, no less. And they would follow instructions and do things the way you asked them to do it. Am I telling the truth? Why? Well, it's simple. Because talk is cheap. Faith, my friend, has no value. It is vanity. It will not save you. It will not sanctify you. It will not secure your justification if your actions are not present to activate that faith. You know, there's some glues you buy and they have what they call activator. And you, if you've ever been to the hardware store and you've seen these glues and they'll have a little, uh, looks almost like a needle type thingy with a plunger on it, but it has two cylinders, one here and one here. And then it leads up to one nozzle in the end. And you look at that and think, well, what on earth, why in the world would, would I need that for... Uh, for glue, you know, for something to, to bond things together. Well, it's simple because you have one ingredient over here, but then the other ingredient right next to it is what they call the activator. And guess what? You can use the stuff in that tube till the cows come home, and it is not going to hold nothing for nothing. It ain't, it ain't going to do nothing, not a thing. Because in order for what's in the left side of the plunger to work, you have to also mix with it what's in the right side of the plunger. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? 
has to be activated. When you put those two ingredients together, then bam, all of a sudden you've got something that can hold a steamship together. You've got something that can hold iron on iron. You know what I'm telling you now? You see, but you say, well, why do they do it that way? Well, it's easy because if they mix it all together in the tube, you would take the tube home, open it up, and all you'd have is a solid tube. You wouldn't be able to push out the glue because that's how, it, once it's activated, it immediately turns into that strong iron-like substance. So that's why they have to keep them separate until you need it to do the job you want it to do. Faith without the activator is there. What is the activator? Action. Faith without action is dead. There are people who say, well, I believe in God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I just don't go to church. I believe God answers prayer. Glory to God. I just don't pray. I believe this. I believe that. I believe this. I believe that. I just don't. I love my husband. I just don't ever build him up. I love my wife. I just don't ever buy her flowers. Hello now. Oh, you can talk the talk till the cows come home. My father used to, literally, my father used to sometimes uh, buy cards and stuff like for my mother for holidays and stuff. Now, he would abuse her and he would mistreat her and he would speak evil of her and he would have nothing good to say to anybody ever, ever about her. But he still on occasion would give her a card or something, you know. And I'm sure it was so he could secure himself some, you know. But if you really loved your wife, if you really love your spouse, if you really care about that person that you're with, then your actions should demonstrate that. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? It's the same exact concept as faith without action is dead being alone. Abraham did things. He went so far as to offer his son Isaac on an altar. He was prepared to take Isaac's life. Why did Abraham do that? Because he believed God. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? Why do we go to church? Why do we pray? Why do we tithe? Why do we give? Why do we do the things we do as children of God? It's because we believe. It's not to make us believe or to help us believe, but rather it is in demonstration of the faith that we have. But if we don't have any actions that helps to activate our faith, then our faith is all in our mouth. And according to James, paraphrasing, talk is cheap. Matthew 5, 14 through 16, Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men, that they may see your good works, and glorify your Father which is in heaven. I'm going to tell you something. You can profess faith all you want to, but people cannot see your profession. But they will see your actions. You can claim to be a Christian all you want to. People don't see your claims. They see your actions. Do your actions demonstrate that your faith is real. In Galatians 5, 1-5, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty 
wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you, that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised, that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Christ is become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. For we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. Many today confuse the word works found in James chapter 2 with the term works as it refers to the works of the law. The specified works of the law do not save, but unspecified, circumstance-specific actions are necessary if our faith is to be validated through action. Too many Christians, otherwise known as believers, are believers only. They claim to believe the gospel. They claim to believe the Bible. They claim to believe the promises of God. Yet for all their claims of faith, their conduct and their actions do not support their claims. Christians, for instance, who claim that they believe God is in control and yet they struggle every hour of their lives to try and change circumstances or situations in government, in law, in society, in culture, all in an effort to make the world more consistent with their image of how things should be. Their faith is in their mouth. And talk is cheap. What about those who refuse to give for fear that they then will be left without? You say, what do you mean, Pastor? There's a lot of people who won't give because they're afraid if they give what they got that they'll wind up lacking in the end and they'll not have what they need. Am I telling the truth? I have family members who are supposed to be Christian, Holy Ghost filled people and yet they were some of the most selfish people you ever wanted to meet in your life. They wouldn't give. I don't care if you were standing in front of them dying. They weren't going to give to help you no kind of way. And in the end their reasoning was, hey, I may need that one day. I may need that money. I may need that item. I may need those clothes. I may need that food. I remember when I was pastoring my first church. It's been an awful long time ago now. Almost 40 years, close. And one of my church members, Sue and Leo, came to me and they said, Pastor, we have a friend she goes to an Assembly of God church down uh, the roadways and she said, they, honestly, that church doesn't help her. They don't do anything for her. She said, that poor woman has two children and she doesn't have a husband and the only income she has is the child support and the spousal support from her ex-husband and what have you. And, you know, she said uh, they she and her kids really, really struggle a lot. And she said, and honestly, I was just by there the other day talking to her. And she doesn't have any groceries in her cabinet. She said, is there any way we can help her? And I said, absolutely, of course there is. So after church, we went down to my little apartment we were meeting on the third floor of an old outfellas building and I had actually rented an office suite on the second floor and the owner of the building allowed me to kind of convert it and make it into a little apartment and uh, so 
I, I went down into my apartment, and in the room that I had set up as a kitchen, I began to take groceries out of my cabinets and put them into bags. And I'm taking all this food out of my cabinet and putting it into boxes and bags. And Sue and Leo said, well, Pastor, uh, you're giving away everything you got here. I said, don't you need to hold on to something? I said, no. I said, because she has a need. She's got kids. I said, we have the ability, I have the ability to meet that need. I said, and I also have the faith to know that God's going to take care of me. See, my actions suggested that my faith was real. I wasn't afraid to give away what I had because I knew God was going to take care of me. I'm not going to go hungry. I'm not going to starve today. I'm not worried about it. I said, no, I'm fine. Let, let, she's the one that needs the groceries right now. And then I went to a grocery store and I spent at the time, this is back, you know, almost 40 years ago, I spent $20, $25 on some hamburger and some chicken and some different meats, you know, uh, uh, beef stew chunks and what have you. And I put that together and I brought all that to this lady's house and I left it for her and I called Sue and I said, Sue, tell, the, tell that lady, because I didn't know her yet, she eventually became a member of our church, but I said, go ahead and tell that lady that, I, that uh, there's some stuff outside of her door. She needs to go get it. And that lady came, and boy, she told Sue how thrilled she was. She said, my God, there was enough food there to feed us for two weeks. She said, it was amazing. I couldn't believe how much food there was. But you see, our actions activate our faith. Our actions demonstrate our faith. If our faith is real, then our actions are going to manifest what is in our heart. And what is real to us. What about those who refuse to live as the word of God dictates? Because they are too busy trying to create an outcome. Rather than trust the Lord to orchestrate the outcome. Oh my goodness. How many people try to manipulate everything in their life so that they can, well, I'm going to make sure I wind up where I want to be. Tommy said, you know, that there have been some jobs that he's seen online and stuff that he could apply for, but they're in this place, so they're in that place. I said, apply for it. He says, well, but would you really want to live there? I said, nope, sure wouldn't, but apply for it. Why? Because I believe God. If God wants us there, he'll open the door for us to go there. If he doesn't want us there, he will close that door. I've been praying that. I've been asking God to do that. So if I believe what I'm saying, then I'm going to do what I'm doing. Do you follow what I'm saying? Your actions are going to coincide with your faith. I'm not about to close any door. I'm asking God to not only give him a good job and give him what he needs career-wise, but also to put us in a place where our ministry and our message will be received. I don't know where that place is. If it's in the middle of Minnesota, then so be it. If it's in Georgia, God help us, so be it. And God knows there's no place in the universe I'd rather less be than Georgia. But like Sister Julie Maston told me years ago, she said, Chuck, the surest way, the, the absolute surest way to wind up having God ask you to do something you don't want to do. She said, all you have to do is tell Him what you won't do. She said, you tell God what you won't do. She said, and by God, that will be the very thing He'll ask you to do. Hello now. Because that's what faith's all about. Hello. So I don't dare say, Lord, I'll never go to this state, or I'll never go to that state. No, sir. I'm not about to say that because the Lord will say, oh, really? <laughs> Guess where I want you to go? No, I trust Him. I claim to trust Him. I profess that I believe Him and I trust Him. And if my profession is true, then my actions are going to demonstrate that my faith is real. In Ephesians 2, 8-10, For by grace 
Are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves? It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Do our actions today support our profession of faith? Or do they contradict that which they claim? Is our faith sufficient to ensure one day we shall lay hold of the righteousness of God, which He has promised those who genuinely believe this gospel? Or are we believing in vain as our actions contradict and thus nullify our faith. My goodness, folks, effortless faith is vanity. Profession of faith without works, actions that supports and demonstrates the faith we claim is not faith at all. You're just playing a game. You're, you're just playing a part, but you're not living the reality of faith. Because the reality of faith is you have to have action. You have to have the activator in order for your faith to work. Hello now. Amen. Praise the name of the Lord.